All right, everybody, I'd like to welcome you all to the, um, I guess this is the August Excel Business Intelligence Virtual Chapter. And we've got a couple slides before I turn it over to Devin Knight. Um, first of all, um, there is a big conference coming up called the Past Summit. It's in Seattle, October 25th through the 28th. Um, Monday and Tuesday before that will be pre-conference session with the regular sessions. Uh, during Wednesday through Friday and all kinds of fun stuff, uh, vendors and um, uh, community things. So uh, if you want to go to the summit and you haven't registered yet, on the bottom of your screen is a discount code, BC15CWV7, you get $150 off the admission. Um, there are many, many virtual chapters. We do all this online, so if uh, Excel BI is not your thing and you're looking for something else, including other languages, you can uh, go to the sqlpass.org slash bc site and you can see all the upcoming events. Also, um, September 7th and 8th is a PASS um, Summit Preview. It's a 24 hours PASS where they do 24 consecutive uh, sessions that introduce you to speakers and people that will be at the PASS Summit. Always, there are SQL Saturdays going on all around the world. Here in the States, we've got uh, Spartanburg, Oklahoma City, Columbus, um, and St. Louis, and Charlotte coming up. You go to SQLSaturday.com to find these free events on Saturday. And of course, our pass is nothing but volunteers. So if you would like to be part of this volunteer community, go to volunteer.sqlpass.org. And once you log in, there's a My Volunteering section. And you can check what you would like to do. And always stay involved um, with things coming up in the past community, LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Twitter, as well as our website. Um, so now I'll go ahead and turn it over to Devin Knight. Um, Devin has presented for us many times. Uh, he has some great insights into Power BI, and um, I'm sure you all going to enjoy this session. All right. Thank you, Thomas. Appreciate the uh, introduction. And uh, yeah, I'll test. There's a, some great things you guys could be doing also within inside of Pass. And, and Thomas, we're getting a little bit of background noise. If you don't mind, just uh, muting to eliminate some of that, uh, hopefully. There we go. Perfect. Much better. All right. Well, uh, again, thank you guys for having me. You know, thank you, Thomas, for having me. And I uh, look forward to having a good session with you guys. Uh, one of my favorite topics is Power BI. And uh, we're going to be looking at a topic that in some ways is a little bit more advanced, but it's actually been made simpler or easier to do with some of the latest releases of Power BI. So uh, if you guys have questions, uh, you can put them in the, the, the chat, and, or not the chat, but the Q&A, and uh, Thomas will be able to show me those towards the end or, or tell me what the questions are at the end. Uh, but let's go ahead and get started. If you're not really familiar with who I am, again, my name is Devin Knight. I work for a company called Pragmatic Works where I'm the training director. And uh, basically that means I, I run anything having to do with training. We do uh, things like free webinars similar to this. We also do paid training uh, as well. And I'm not going to bore you with the details of that. This is more of a, a community event. Uh, I also am a, a SQL Server or what they call now a Data Platform MVP. And uh, that's just kind of a fancy title to say I like to talk about our technology that we work in. I've also authored a few books, uh, actually up to six, uh, all focused in on uh, Microsoft BI. And I run a local user group, very similar to this, but one that meets in person in Jacksonville, Florida. That tells you where I'm from. I'm from Jacksonville, where I run a local SQL Server user group called JSUG, or Jacksonville SQL Server User Group. I also blog at a website called DevonKnightSQL.com. If you're really interested in BI, uh, Power BI, or even Excel uh, technologies that you can do with BI, I recommend taking a look at my blog. I have a lot of uh, posts that I've done uh, ongoing. Yeah, I'm actually doing a, a series of posts right now where I'm releasing a free class basically through my blog on all the Power BI custom visuals and showing you how to work with those. Uh, but I've done a lot of posts in the past. In fact, one of the topics that we're going to be talking about today about how to use parameters, I have done on my blog in the past. So you can kind of see a step-by-step -step on how to do some of the things we're going to talk about today. All right, so I don't have a ton of slides. We're going to get straight into the material, material here, but I do have this one slide to really talk about and give you some context around the discussion we're going to have today around parameters and templates. Now, parameters and templates are definitely two separate features, 
but uh, parameters are a are, are feature that you'll oftentimes use that you don't necessarily have to have templates with, whereas with templates you probably are going to have some form of a parameter. We'll, we'll talk about what I mean by that as we get going. Uh, but basically the idea of these is parameters, we'll start with that, is to make it so that the results that you have in a Power BI solution can be made dynamic. So if you want to make your solution dynamic in any way, you're likely going to be doing that through something called parameters. Uh, not so different than if you come from a SQL background, doing things like store procedures and variables. It's very similar to what you would do there. Now, the nice thing about how parameters work with Power BI is they allow you to not only parameterize the query that you're using to extract data from some source, they also allow you to make dynamic the connection information. So if you're trying to connect to a particular database or a particular file, that connection information can also be made dynamic, which is a really neat thing about how this works. And I'm going to walk you through how to use that. And I'm also going to show you here initially how you would do this sort of thing prior to uh, Power BI having these new investments on the UI side to make it a lot easier for you to use parameters. So think about parameters like this. Uh, say you wanted to pull in some information and you'd like to make it so that the source of, for that query is dynamic. You can use parameters to dynamically filter the results or dynamically change the connection information with, with those parameters. And so maybe you want to dynamically change which database or which spreadsheet is being used as the data source. Uh, parameters are going to allow you to do that. So the values that are made dynamic, you can swap out uh, with different values at any point in time. And you can either do that through kind of a, a traditional drop-down selection, or you can just have it as an empty text box that someone uh, provides a new value for. Now, templates are a little bit different. Usually, you'll see templates built on top of parameters. The idea behind templates is to not just make a query or a connection dynamic, it's to create a completely dynamic or compartmentalized solution. So you can think about it like this. Templates allow you to compartmentalize everything except for the data. So let me put that caveat in there. It does not include data. But it allows you to compartmentalize the query that you write, the data model that you created, and the reports that you've built. It allows you to compartmentalize all those into a single file. And it includes everything, all those things, again, except for the data. So it's not going to include the data with that. So you'll use parameters and templates together to make kind of a full solution to hand off to somebody else. So if I create a solution that's built off of a, let's say, a, an Access database, for example, and I've created this Power BI solution on top of Access, and now I want to hand this off to someone else that has a, a, a similar structured Access database but just has different data, then I can create a template out of my Power BI solution hand that template off to them, and all they have to do is to type in the location where their version of that access database is, and then the whole Power BI solution builds around their version of the data. So that's really how templates work, and we'll get a view of how those work here as we get going into our uh, webinar here today. Now, the first thing I'd like to do, before we get into several of the examples I have, I have three or four different examples I'm going to show you. But before I get into that, I do want to show you something kind of interesting, which is to discuss how you did this stuff before. Uh, you've actually always had parameters inside of Power BI, whether you're using Excel Power BI or whether you're using Power BI Desktop. You've always had parameters, uh, but they've just made it much easier to use them. Now, primarily through the session today, I'm going to be using the Power BI Desktop to show how this works. And uh, you'll see that a lot of these features that I'm going to show you are also applicable to the Excel versions of the tools as well. All right, so here's what I'd like to do. I'm going to start off first. Again, we're going to be using the Power BI desktop. Let me close my email. I don't know why I'd have that open. And what we're going to do is uh, walk you through how you would have done parameters before some of the most recent releases with Power BI that have made things much easier. So uh, you can feel my pain a little bit here. You can see that it was a much harder process. And then I'll show you the easy button, the easier way to do these things. So in doing that, what I'd like to do is I'm going to bring over a website. You may have seen this example before or an example that's fairly similar to it. This is a website called boxofficemojo.com. And what I'd like to do on this website is I'm going to go find a list of movies, the, the, the most popular as far as money-making movies, and I want to use that as part of my solution and show you how parameters work or how at least they used to work in the older version of the Power BI desktop and the older version of Excel Power BI. So here's the problem. I have this website. It has some really interesting information on it, like how much money all these movies are making. And if I wanted to, I can go uh, and say, uh, well, show me, for example, all of the movies that have made money of all time. So there's this all time section here. And I can, show, I can ask for not only do I want to see it for um, 
the domestic movies, but also worldwide. So I can select worldwide here. And it's going to show me a list of all of the most mon highest money-making or money-earning uh, movies worldwide, not just domestic, not just overseas, but for the entire world. And so you can see probably some movies up here that don't surprise you. You have Star Wars, uh, Avatar is still one of the top money-making movies of all time. Titanic is right there with it. So it's interesting to be able to see this information. And the, what's what's kind of frustrating about this is as I go to look at this data, I can scroll down, I can see what the top 100 movies look like. But once I get to a point on the bottom, you notice that it only shows the top 100. And if I want to go to the next 100 movies, I have to click on one of these links down here on the bottom, and that will take me to another page. You can see it's now got me on page two, where I'm seeing the next list of movies. Now, what I'd like to do is I want to make it so that I can see all of the movies at once. I want to be able to analyze every single one of these movies, because maybe what I'm really interested in is to see what kind of trends I have with movie studios. So you can see I have this movie studio column. And I want to see what kind of trends there are with the movie studio. So I really need to get all of this data, not just the first 100 movies. Now, to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to take this URL that we have up at the top. And I'm going to copy this URL. And you'll notice there's a little entry point that we can use here. You'll notice in the URL, there's this little a section here or parameter in the URL called page number equals. And we can use that to be able to feed in all of the page numbers that we want to render out into Power BI. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy the URL that we see up top here, copy that out. I'm going to take that over now to Power BI. And you know what? I'm going to turn off one feature here because there's something I have turned on that I want to make sure that I highlight a bit later. So bear with me for one second while I turn this off. Pay no attention to that. All right. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take the results of that URL, and we're going to go pull in the data here from this Get Data section. So you'll find Get Data here, and I'll select Get Data and tell it that I want to pull data from the web. There's a web option here, and I'll go ahead and select Web. I'll paste in the URL that I have copied from the web, uh, the web browser, and I'll hit OK. Now what this is going to do is it's going to pull in data from that web page, and it's going to find two possible objects that I might want to pull in from the website. One is this one here called Table Zero, which has exactly really what I want. It has all the, pay, the, the movies for the uh, movies ranked 101 to 200. And then there's also this one here called Document that doesn't really have anything relevant for what I want to do today. So I'm going to select the one here called Table Zero. And on the bottom, I'll select Edit. Now, this is a little bit more of an advanced session, so I'm skipping over some of the high-level stuff. If you're brand new to Power BI, I definitely recommend looking at some of the previous sessions that you guys have had to get some more introductory idea of how you're working with Power BI or how to use Power BI. But in this case, I'm going to paste in that URL, select Table Zero, and hit Edit. And what this is going to do is it's going to launch the query editor for me where I can start to take a look at the data that I've now imported and start to manipulate it some. Okay, now what's great about this is, yes, it does give me all the information that I had on that web page that we looked at just a moment ago, but really, remember, the, the problem I'm trying to solve is that I want to be able to see all six or seven of the pages. Let's see how many pages it was that we were looking at just a moment ago. It was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different pages that are on that web page, and I want to be able to bring in all seven of those into my solution. Right now, I'm only looking at page number two. And so the, salute, the, way to, the way to work on this and the way to solve this problem is by using parameters. Now, the previous way, the older way to do parameters was this. You would actually come up to the top of the ribbon here, underneath the home ribbon, and you would select the advanced editor. Now, again, remember in this first demo, I'm showing you the older way of doing it, and then I'm going to show you some smaller examples of the new way to show you how much easier it is to do now. But first, I want you to appreciate where we came from. And there's still going to be some reasons why you have to do this method I'm about to show you. All right. So I'm going to go under the advanced editor here. And inside the advanced editor, we are looking at the query language behind the query editor, which is called M. It's just the letter M stands for mashup. And you'll use this mashup language for doing things like data transformations with your data. This is also what you'll use to be able to inject things like parameters into the query that you've created as well. So, for example, what I'd like to do is where it says let, I'm going to come to the very beginning of the query because if you have any kind of context, if you've worked with SQL before, if you've done parameters before with SQL Server or store procedures, then you're probably familiar that usually you're declaring things like parameters at the very beginning. And that's what we're doing in this scenario as well. I'm going to come to the very top of the query that we're looking at, and I'm going to declare a variable here called page number. 
Okay. Now, when you do it, you're going to do it inside of parentheses like this, and then you'll do an equals greater than sign, which is how you declare a variable here inside of the M query language. So we've simply just declared a variable here called page number. Now, if we want to use that variable, we can come over here to the URL. Here's the URL that we pasted in earlier. You can see it right here. And what I want to do is I want to replace this hard-coded number 2, so it's been kind of hard-coded in there. I want to replace that with my variable I just created. And so it's as simple as this. I can do in parentheses. I can type in uh, page number. By the way, mQuery is case sensitive, so however I typed it up top, I better type it the same way here. And then the other thing I'll need to do as well is because I'm injecting this variable in the middle of some string or some text that I have, I need to put double quotes around it. So I'm going to put double quotes around this, and in fact, I not only need to put double quotes, but I also need to concatenate those double quotes together as well. So here's what I've added so far, that piece I have highlighted. So I've taken the page number, I've placed that page number, and injected it in the middle of my URL. Now that I've done that, we're, we're almost there. We almost have something that's fairly useful. The one thing that I like to do to kind of protect myself is think about the nature of a URL or, or a, 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 a website. That website URL is a string. And right now, I'm trying to inject a number in the middle of that string. If I type the number 1, whenever I make this into a parameter, it's going to assume that it's a number. And so what I want to do to kind of protect myself a little bit is I'm going to do a little bit of an mQuery function here where I'm going to say I want to do a number dot to text function. And basically what that does is it allows me to convert anytime somebody puts a number in to convert it to a string. And again, the reason why we're doing that is because we have a URL string. We can't inject a number in the middle of a string and expect it to work. So, we've uh, put double quotes around this, we've uh, concatenated it, that's what the little ampersand is here and at the end, and then we told it that we want to call our variable called page number, and then we're using the number to text function to convert that number that is uh, going to be returned here into a string which will fit in the rest of our URL. All right, so we've got that taken care of. Really two small pieces. We added that and we added the declaration of that parameter up at the top. Now when we hit done, you'll notice here that it's waiting for us to actually key in a parameter value. You'll see here it's turned this now into a function, and with that function I can type in some kind of a value. So I can type in something like, well, show me page number 5 this time. And if I hit invoke on that, it's going to return back all sorts of values that are for page number 5. So here we're looking at uh, results from 401 to 500. Uh, if I wanted to try that again, I can delete this query that was the result of that. I could delete that. Okay, like so. And I can try it again by typing in, let's say, page number three this time. So if I invoke that this time, I can see a different set of movies that are returned back, and we can see that there clearly is um, a difference each time we run that. All right, I'm going to delete this one more time. Okay, so we've got the result here. We've created a function. I'm going to give the function a name, so let's call this uh, movies. Okay, and then what I'd like to do, remember what my problem was I was trying to solve was I want to see all of the movies at once, not just a certain page, not just page 2 or 5 or 3, I want to see all of the values for every one of the pages at the same time. So to do that, we're going to have to create another query that lists off the page numbers we want to pass into this function. So to create another query, we'll come up to the top here where it says home and select new source. And we're going to do a blank query this time. We'll be a little adventurous here. We're tempting fate here a bit. So in a blank query, a blank query is basically where you're going to write the M. That's the query language behind the scenes here. But you're going to write the M query that makes up the result. And so what we can do is we can come up to this formula bar that we're looking at. And I can tell it that I'd like to see, and you just like you do with Excel, you start with an equal sign. We can tell it that I want to see all of the values that are between, let's say, 1 and 7. Okay, and you know what, what I'm missing here is a little curly braces, like so, and that'll bet return a list between 1 and 7. So that two periods there is very similar to like a between. You can also use this with uh, alphabet as well. So if I did something like between A and between Z, it would return a list between A and Z. So it is smart here. It's able to determine that is really a between to give me all the values between that range. All right, so I want everything between 1 and 7, like so. And then I want to return this as a table. Right now, this is being returned back as a list. 
A list is kind of like an array. If you, if you come from a programming background, it's like an object variable, a list of values. And so I want to take that list and convert it to a table by simply clicking this to table button up in the top left. Again, the reason why I need to convert it to a table is because you can't start to pass values in for each row into my function unless they are actually rows. So I'll hit OK to convert that to a table. I'll give this a new column name here. I'll call this something like page number. Okay, and then what I'd like to do is I want to pass in the, this list of values that I've now created into my function that we created a moment ago called movies. So to do that, you would come up to the top ribbon here, and we'd select uh, add a column. So I'll select add column here, and we're going to add in a custom column. Okay, now again, these are some complicated steps. Remember, what, the reason why I'm showing you this is because, yes, you can still do it this way, but a lot of the things that they've done now with the recent Power BI updates have made these things easier to do. And so I'm giving you a little appreciation of what you had to do before. There are some cases where you still have to do the advanced editor, and you'll see some of those as we, we go through our first set of examples. All right, so I'm going to do add a custom column. Okay, so select add custom column, and we're going to call the movies function that we created earlier. So I'll call the movies function, I'll type in movies to basically call and reference that function that we have over here. Okay, you can see a little FX icon indicates that it is a function. And then I'm going to pass into that movies function the page number. So I'll select page number and insert that into my function, like so. And then I'll simply hit OK. Now what's going to happen is it's going to bring me back a new column that is the result of every one of those columns or every one of these values being inserted into my function. And if I want to see all of the values at once, I can simply hit the little expand button that's at the top of the column right here. If I hit this expand button, I can then tell it to bring back all of the columns from that function. You'll notice none of these columns exist in this query. It's actually bringing these columns back from the other query. All right, one thing I usually like to do here as well is to uncheck this uh, use original column name as prefix. That way it doesn't call it custom custom rank and custom.title. So I'll uncheck that and then hit OK. All right, so we've got a list of all of the movies. And how do I know it's every one of the pages? Well, check this out. As you scroll down, as I start to scroll down, you'll see it changes from page number one to page number two. It'll eventually change to page number three page number four, and so I am getting all of the movies from every one of the pages on that website now. Uh, now, there might be a few things you want to do to clean this up. So say, for example, I wanted to, um, I think there is a case in here where the years are kind of funny looking. Let's see, yeah, you can see here the years are have funny characters in them. So you may want to do something like remove characters like this. This is just some of the standard things you can do in the query editor. I'm going to tell it that I want to remove a value, and I want to get rid of this little carrot symbol that you see right here. Oh, I went around on top of it, but you get the idea right there. I want to remove that. So I'm going to tell it I want to replace that little carrot symbol with nothing. Hit OK, and then it gets rid of those carrot symbols for me. That's better. I also want to get rid of some of these percentage columns. So I'll get rid of these two columns here. Remove those columns. And it leaves me now with just the columns that are relevant to my data or my solution I'm trying to create. Now I can see worldwide, domestic, and overseas. It has the percentage in the column, but these are actually uh, uh, dollar amounts that we see here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these three columns, I'm going to convert the data type so we can actually bring this into a proper visual, and then we'll move on to some of my other examples here. All right, good deal. So I think I have everything I need. I'm going to go ahead and hit close and apply to show you what we can do with this. I should have uh, named the query something better than query one, but I think you get the idea. And so what it's doing is it's pulling back all of the data from that Box Office Mojo website. It's now brought all seven of the pages into Power BI, and I can start to visualize this data. So for example, if I wanted to see how my uh, movie studios rank, I can bring in something like the domestic, overseas, and worldwide results. And uh, let's make this a little larger, and let's look at it by movie studio like that. And I also want to animate this by year. I can add a play access to this. Now, this, real, this is the visual side of things. This is just kind of adding to uh, what we've already done, not really necessary for what we're trying to do here, but it gives you an idea of where you can take this a step further. And um, so let's say, for example, that I really wanted to know which Disney movie was the most popular Disney movie of all time. Well, here's what we can do. I can tell it that I want to sort the uh, movies by revenue here. Okay. 
Let me make that a little smaller. There we go. And then I probably want to label these. By the way, BV is Buena Vista. That's also Disney. So I can select Disney here, for example, and I can see which are the top most popular or most, I shouldn't say most popular, the most money-making movies of all time. You can see here is Star Wars, uh, Marvel, Marvel's Avengers, Avengers Age of Ultron, Frozen is all the way down to number four. That's surprising. So you can kind of see here as you select these and as you work with these, you can see the popularity. And I could even do something like add in the labels onto this chart if I wanted to. Again, our focus for this, this session is not around visualizations, it's more around working with the query editor, but I wanted to give you a picture of what you can do in here. So I'm more kind of showing here as, as different movie studios become more popular, you can see how they go back and forth. There's Buena Vista here in the early 2000s, and it kind of has some peak of popularity in the late 2000s here. All right. So again, it gives you an idea here of how you can work with data, how you can use parameters. Now, what I'd like to do next is I'm actually going to close this out and I'm going to open up a new instance of the Power BI desktop because what I'd like to do is show you some of the new features, the new capabilities, at least newer, uh, only a couple months old now, that are available for being able to create and use parameters in a new method. Okay, this, that me previous method I showed was a little bit tougher. You had to go modify the query, but they've made things a lot easier now, and I'd like to show you how to do that in the more easy-to-consume method. So, in this new method for doing things, there are a separate set of parameters that you can, a separate way to create parameters. I'd like to show you that today. So, to get started, we're going to go ahead and go pull in some data. And this, for this first example, I'm going to pull in some data from uh, Excel. Now, one thing I'm going to do real quickly is I want to make sure my SQL Server is running because we will have an example where I pull in some data from SQL. It looks like it is running, so we're good to go there. And so what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to go select Get Data up at the top, and I'm going to select Excel to pull in some data from my Excel workbook that I have. And the Excel workbook that I have for this example is their original name here called Source Data. And so I'll select this one called Source Data and hit Open. Now what I want to do in this example is I want to be able to filter down this source data that we have and make it so that I can parameterize that filter. So, for example, we're looking at AdventureWorks data here. So you, maybe you're familiar with AdventureWorks. These, this is bike sales. And so what I'd like to do is I want to make it so that it's dynamic, so that if somebody wants to see all of the bikes that were sold that, that have the color red or have the color blue or black, I want to make that a parameter so they can very easily swap the results and see things specifically for what they care about. So to get started, I'm going to go ahead and select the products table here. Okay. And I'll hit edit to bring that into the query editor. All right. Now, I can see this inside the query editor. This is showing me the results for the table, the products table. And as I scroll to the right, you'll see there's a bunch of different columns that I could choose to filter, but one that may, may, may be a little easier to be able to understand the problem we're trying to solve is the color column. So there is a column in here. Maybe I already passed it. There it is right here called color. And what I'd like to do is I want to apply a filter, again, a parameter, so that it's very easy to swap the results based on the color I'd like to see for the report or for whatever we're trying to build here. All right, so to do that, I would come up to where you see the color filter area where you have the drop down next to the column, and I would uh, hit the drop down here. And I would go over, you could select a filter here, and you can filter which one you'd like to filter, or you can come here to text filters, and you can tell it that you want to apply a text filter where it is equal to, so I would select equals. And then once you select that, you can type in a value of what you would like to filter. Okay. Now keep a mental image of this, because what I would expect to see here is the ability to also add a parameter. But the parameter feature that you would normally see here is actually not turned on by default. There is a parameter feature that you get to right now, but if I wanted to make this filter into a parameter right away, that feature is actually hidden by default, and I'd like to show you how to turn that on. So I'm going to hit cancel for a moment because what I'd like to do is I don't want to type in a value here. I actually want to make it so that it refers to a parameter instead of me typing in blue. I want to parameterize this query. So let me come back to this for a moment, but I really just wanted to show you here's where we're going to be coming eventually. Right now, you'll notice there is no way to parameterize this. You're going to see that feature turned on in just a moment. So to turn on the ability to, to parameterize things like filters and connections right away, you can do that by going up to the File menu. Now if I go to File and Options and Settings and select Options, so you're going to the File menu, Options and Settings, and then Options. 
once you go to the top there, you'll see there's a section here called uh, Query Editor, Editor. And underneath the Query Editor section, you'll check out this option here called Always Allow Parameterization in Data Source in Transformation Dialogs. Go ahead and check that off. It is not turned on by default. Now, just because it's not turned on doesn't mean you can't do it. Uh, the, what, what happens here behind the scenes is whenever you want to parameterize something, if you do not have this feature turned on, then you have to have a parameter created ahead of time to be able to use it. Um, and, and in this case, we haven't created a parameter yet. That's what we're trying to do. Uh, so we have to kind of go ahead and turn this on now. Again, you can still use parameters if you don't turn this on. It's just you have to create the parameter first and then go to the filter options. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and check this off and hit OK. All right, and then we're going to now come back over to here where it says the uh, color column, and we're going to hit the drop down and tell it that we want to do a text filter again where it's equal to something. So we'll select equal. And now notice the difference here. Notice how it's changed. You now have this option here where you can change it between a certain type of data or if you hit the drop down box on this, you can tell it that you want to create a new parameter. That wasn't there until we checked that box off just a moment ago. So if I hit new parameter, this launches the parameters dialog box where you can start to identify the parameter that you want to create. And so we'll create a parameter here. We'll call this, let's, let's be simple with it. Let's call it color. And then you usually always want to give it a description. I certainly recommend giving descriptions here. I said usually, I would say just always do some form of a description here so it's really clear on what this is. So I can do something like uh, uh, select a value to filter the products by color. Something like that so it's really clear on what this parameter is designed to do. Uh, you can determine whether this, fill, this parameter is required or not, so that means you can have optional parameters that don't have to be entered into if you'd like. Um, then, below this, you specify the data type of the parameter. So what type of data should be keyed in to a color? Well, it's probably going to be some kind of a text value. So you can select text here, and then you can tell it where it says allowed, allowed values is where you can specify where are the values coming from? Are they coming from just an empty text box where my user types in a value? That's what the default is where it says any value is just an empty text box. Or I can specify a list of values where I actually give it a list of values. That's what we're going to do for this first example. Or you can get the values from a query. Now, from my experience thus far, this option to get values from a query uh, has a little bit left to be desired here. It doesn't, doesn't feel like it's completely where it, what, what I would have expected it to do. If you've worked with tools like reporting services before to be able to fill in parameters, then you might have done something like populated a parameter field from a query. It doesn't quite work like that. This is something you'll use more for being able to do things like filtering. It um, looks like this, this one particular feature that's fairly new needs a little bit of work still in my opinion. So what we're going to do is we're going to select list of values and we're going to go down here to where we can actually specify a list of values that we want my users to be able to select from. So what I'll do is I'll type in a couple values. By the way, it is case sensitive, so if I had done lowercase b on black, then it wouldn't return anything. I'll type uh, blue for another product color and let's do red for the last one. All right, then on the bottom, you can specify what you want the default value to be for this parameter. And then you also have an option to select what you want the current value to be. Now, there is a difference. You can have the default be defaulted to blue, for example. But you can say the current value, meaning the, the value I want it to be set to at this very moment, is red. So you can do something like that. I can select the default to be blue and the current value to be red. And they, yes, they are allowed to be different. They do mean different things. One is what is the default whenever I open this thing. And then the other one is whatever I um, want it to be as of this very moment. All right, so I'll hit OK on this. And you'll notice that it now has changed my filter to set it equal to a color parameter that we just created. It's not set to a certain value. It's set to my parameter that we have. So when I hit OK on this, what happens is you'll notice that it immediately filters to red because if you remember just a second ago, I told it that the current value for that parameter should be red. You'll also notice on the left-hand side, here's where the parameter is that we created a few moments ago. So you'll see the color parameter on the left with the current value set to red. Now if you go to that parameter on the left-hand side, I'll also notice if, if you hover above it, you'll see the little tool tip here that shows the description that we created earlier. But if you go to that parameter, you'll notice here that you can change the value. Right now, the current value is red, but you can change that here by selecting the drop-down, and you can change it to anything you want, really, here. I can change it to black, blue, 
And then as soon as I change the value here and go back over to the products query, you'll notice that it has immediately changed it to, try, sorry, trying to show you the black column there. It immediately has changed the color column to filter to black, okay? So that's kind of a, a, a very basic example of how parameters work. They allow you to kind of filter your queries down based on a selection or a text box that you type in. Now the next step would be is I could hit close and apply and I could take this into the report design service and we'll be pretty quick here because I know our focus isn't on reporting. But what I can do here is I can bring in something like the color column, let's bring in a few things, the color, let's bring in the product name, here we go, and let's just leave it at that, that's fine. And I can test that this parameter works here as well. I'm going to increase the size of the table a little bit so you can actually read it. There we go. All right, and so what I'd like to do is I want to make it so that I can use that parameter that we created a few moments ago from the report design surface. And that can be done by coming up to this top section here where it says edit queries. Up in the edit query section, you'll notice there's this little drop-down arrow. If you select that drop-down arrow, that allows you to change a parameter value. You'll see here where it says edit parameters, that allows you to change the value that's being used on the parameter that we started with. So I'll select edit parameters, and you'll notice that it pops this open, and I can select which one of the values that I want to change the parameter value to. So if I want to change it to blue this time, I can hit blue and hit OK, and you should see once I hit apply changes, it reruns the query behind the scenes, and it just brings back the data for the blue values. Okay. Now, what's happening behind the scenes is this is a little bit different. This is actually filtering down the results in, from the query side. It's not bringing all the data in first and then filtering it. What's happening is it's filtering it as it brings it in uh, into the, on the query side. So there is, there is some things going on there behind the scenes where it's not, not working with the entire data set. It's just working with the data set for the blue values in this case. All right, so one of the questions I get a lot, and maybe I can't see the chat, the question and answer right now, but one of the questions I get a lot is about how do I interact from this from the web portal? So say, for example, I publish this to the Power BI service, how do I then interact with the parameter? Well, I got bad news for you. Right now, you can't. There is no capability from the web side of things to be able to interact with the parameter values like we have here. It's a little bit different uh, in that it doesn't, isn't able to handle that at this point. So you might be asking then, all right, well then what's the point? Why do I have this? Well, I think the idea of templates will, will answer part of that question. And then I have a few other examples I want to show you here next that might also help answer some of those questions. All right, so the next example that I'd like to show you is one that's kind of interesting. I think it's a kind of a rare scenario where you might do something like this. And uh, so let me, let me set the stage for, for you a little bit for this next example. Uh, in this next example, what I'd like to show you is how you can actually make an entire table dynamic. All right, so what do I mean by that? Well, let's say that I, here, here's, my, here's my genuine business scenario for why I might want to do this. Let's say that I've imported a data model and it has five or six, maybe it has 15 different tables in it, okay? And those 15 tables are really useful to just about everybody in my organization. So I release this data model, and it has everything that everybody needs, except for there's a few folks that like to pull in different tables. They like to have the ability to select certain tables that are more relevant to them. But if I bring those in in addition to the other 15 tables I have, then it's going to start to confuse everybody else. So one idea of what you can do here is you can actually make a table dynamic using parameters. And you can make it so that your user can actually type in a table name, and then it changes here in the field list to just show the one that they've typed in. Now, again, I don't think you would do this a ton. You wouldn't have a bunch of dynamic tables. You would likely have a set of static tables, and then maybe one dynamic table for that user that wants to be able to change things or import things more dynamically. So let me show you how this idea works. I'm going to go ahead and uh, close out this instance of the Power BI desktop. i got another one open here ready to go. And so what I'd like to do for this example is I'm going to go pull in some data from SQL Server. So I'm going to go to Get Data, and I'm going to select SQL Server for this example. And you'll notice here that you can make the connections dynamic, okay? So that's good. That's something that we'll show in our next example is how we can make the connections dynamic. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect to my local instance of SQL Server for this example. And we're going to connect to my uh, AdventureWorks database. Okay. And I'll hit OK to go ahead and see a list of all the tables that we have inside that database. 
the one I'll start with, I'll just start with the customer table. So I'll go ahead and select customer here and hit edit. Okay. Now, to make this dynamic, this is going to be something that's a little bit more complicated. We will have to go dig into the advanced editor to be able to do this. But what I'd like to show you to be the, the, the capabilities to even try this is to first uh, go through the process of creating a parameter by itself. So the first time we created a parameter, we went through the uh, parameter editor here, the edit parameter screen, and we did that from the filter menu. Remember, we were trying to filter the color of the, the product, and we created a parameter directly from there. Well, if you're not doing it on a filter, then you can still create parameters, and you do that by coming up to this manage parameter section up top here, and you want to hit the down arrow. When you hit the down arrow on that, you can also select that you want to create a new parameter. So I'll click new parameter here. And I'll give the parameter a name. So let's call this something like uh, table. Table name's fine. And I can give this a description. Let's call this uh, my dynamic table parameter. Okay. Uh, the data type here is going to be a text again. And then I'm going to leave it as an any value here. Any value meaning that it's a text box that someone can just type a value into. And I'll make a the current value I'll set to the table that we're already looking at, which is dim customer. Okay. So we've got a parameter set up. It's a little bit more simple this time. We didn't do a list of values. We just said, here's a text box. So you type in the table name you want, and we'll return the table you want. All right. So I'll hit OK. Okay. And here's my parameter. We have two objects here on the left-hand side. We have a parameter called table name with the current value of dim customer. And then we have our original query that we created a moment ago called dim customer up at the top. Now, if we want to make the dim customer query dynamic, we'll need to go to the advanced editor. So go up to the advanced editor on the top here. And from the advanced editor, you might be able to notice where we need to make some changes. Uh, right here, for perhaps, perhaps, where it says uh, item equals uh, dim customer. If we wanted to swap that out and make it something more dynamic, we could do that by simply replacing the table name that was hard-coded in here with dim customer. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, not dim customer. Table name. That was the name of our variable. All right, so if I replace that with table name here, and I don't even think we need the parentheses around it. Let's take that out. And we hit done. Let's see if I got that right. Looks like I did. So what we've done now is we've taken that query that had a hard-coded table name in it. This is almost like dynamic SQL, right? Where you can kind of do things a little bit more dynamically. And then I've replaced it now with a variable. And so what that means, if I go back to my, my parameter and I change the value here, let's say instead of looking at dim customer, I type in dim geography, okay, and go back over to my table, you'll notice now that we're looking at geography information instead of customer information. Uh, let's say instead of that, we look at dim product. So we go type in dim product here, and we'll see in this case, we're looking at product information. So it's making it where that table name is dynamic. Now, one thing to be very, very, very wary of, if you're going to do something like this, don't apply a bunch of transforms to the query. The, the query that we're looking at right here, if I had applied a bunch of transforms to it, if I had even removed columns and things like that, then it would be referencing certain columns in the query that are likely to change. Because if I'm making the table dynamic and I'm going to swap the table out, then it's a high probability that those column names that existed in the original query will not exist in the next query. So basically what I'm saying is don't add a ton of transforms to this, just basically import the data as is, and then you can work with it. So let's show you what this looks like from the report view. If I hit close and apply, I probably should have renamed the table so it's not called dim customer anymore, maybe something more generic. But you'll see right now the first column name I see here is Arabic description. But if I wanted to swap this to a different table, say, for example, I went up to here where it says edit queries and selected edit parameters like we did earlier, I could swap this this time to dim geography like we did a moment ago. Hit OK. And notice the first column name is going to change, but not only the first column name, all the other columns are going to change here as well. And we're going to have basically a new table to work with. All right, so that's why you probably want to rename the table something more generic in this case. Is it something you're going to use on a regular basis? Probably not, but I think I kind of gave you the one scenario where you might use it, where you bring in a bunch of static tables. Let's say you bring in your standard 15, 20 tables that you always use, and then if you want to make it more flexible for certain users, you can add in something like this and, of course, rename it something more generic. All right. So that's our next example. So that was our next one. So let's look at our one of our last two examples here. 
we're getting close on time here. What we're going to show you in this next example is how you can make a connection dynamic. So we've shown you how to make a uh, filter dynamic, how you can make a, um, a what do I want to say, a, a table dynamic. Let's now show you how you can make a connection to a database dynamic. All right, so I've got, I'm going to close this one out. I got a new instance open of Power BI Desktop. And so what I'd like to show you in this last example is making a connection to the database dynamic as well. Now to do this, you're going to go again connect to the database, and so I'll do that by going up to the file file menu up the home menu up at the top, and selecting Git SQL Server. And you'll notice that you have a, the ability to make these things dynamic here. Uh, now in this case, I would probably do your, your common scenario for this maybe is that I have a a, a development a, a QA and production version of my database, and so what I'd like to do is make it so that I can test what this looks like on QA and what it looks like in production to see what kind of differences there are. That's a kind of common scenario of why you might do this example. In my scenario, I'm I really only have one database instance on my machine, so I'm going to go ahead and reference the one instance I have but we're going to make the database name itself dynamic because I have multiple databases on my server that will be referenced for making this dynamic. So I might look at the production version of the database and then swap to the dev version of the database. It's all within the same server for me in this scenario. So what I will do though is I will make a parameter out of the database name here. So I'll select to create a new parameter and I'll give the parameter a name. We'll call this uh, database. Okay, we'll say select the database you would like your reports built from. All right, and so we'll give the uh, data type is going to be a text value again, and I'm going to give it a list of values again because I think that makes it a little easier for users to know what to type in Ra rather than having to type something in. I just give them a list of databases that they're allowed to use, and so I'm going to type in a couple databases here. Okay, and I'll type in AdventureWorks 2016 or 2012. Okay, and so I have these two databases that they have an option to use that I've now added to the list. And so what I can do is I can default it to the 2016 one if I want here, and then hit OK. But basically, we're giving them a list of values that they're allowed to select from in this parameter. I'll hit OK. Hit OK again. Okay, tell it which table I want to base this off of. I'm going to base this off of the Fact Internet Sales table here. And I'm just going to go ahead and load it. I'll hit load. I'm not even going to go to the query editor this time. Now when I load it, uh, there it is. I was expecting to see that come a little faster. Now when I load it, I'm going to create a small little, uh, let's say a bar or a column chart on top of this, where I'm going to look at the uh, order date and I'm going to look at the order dates, really the years, by sales amount. Okay, And so what I can see here is it looks like I have data from 2010 to 2014. Uh, not very much data in 2010 or 2014. Most of it is from 2011 and 2013. Now, keep in mind that I have multiple databases I can choose from. I have a development database and a production database or QA, whatever you'd prefer to call it. And so what I, what I can do whenever I want to swap out the database that's being used, I can, again, come up to where it says Edit Queries and select Edit Parameters. And so I can choose from the 2016 version of the database that we're looking at right now, and I can swap over to the 2012 version of the database, and notice what happens when I hit OK on this and I confirm it. The chart is going to change significantly. There we go. Or I'm now looking at data between 2005 and 2008. So I've now made this a dynamic solution so that whenever someone else picks this up, they can place in their version of the database or their version of the access database or their version of the spreadsheet. And all they have to do is type in the location of their version of it. And then they're going to see the entire report rebuilt based on their version of the data. Okay, so that's kind of the whole idea with the parameters. Now to really take this one step further is when we start talking about how parameter, I'm sorry, templates work with this. Adding this and creating this into making this a template is really the their logical next step to be able to hand this solution off to someone else. So if I wanted to hand this off to someone else and say, all right, well, go ahead and open up this template, and when you open it, it's going to allow you to um, uh, plug in your spreadsheet name, and when you plug in your version of the spreadsheet, it's going to rebuild everything based around your solution. All right, so let me show you how to create a template. 
To create a template, you're going to go up to the file menu in the very top left of the screen here, and I'll select File and Export. Underneath File and Export, you'll see there's an option here called Power BI Template. We're going to export it as a Power BI Template, so I'll select that. And you definitely want to give it some kind of a description here. So uh, you can do something like uh, sales example, type in your version of the data to get results. Okay? So you want to add descriptions here more than anywhere else because they're actually going to see this whenever they go to open the template. So I'll hit OK on that. And I will save this template. I have a template here. I'm going to save on top of this example I did yes a couple days ago. I'll hit save and replace the template I already have just to show you I'm going through the process here. Okay. And then what I also want to do is uh, this does not actually save the solution, the Power BI solution. So it does not save any data into it. And I want to prove to you how, how I know that. If I go save the entire solution here, and let's call this uh, webinar examples fine and I go to bring open the file folder where those solutions are at, check this out. All right, so here's what we just, you can see this is on uh, 818, that's today, just a few moments ago. I'm on East Coast time, so if the time looks different, that's why. And what I can see in here is there's two files that we created. We created this template example and we created this webinar example. The webinar example includes all of the data it, it's really the full Power BI solution you're probably used to doing, where you have the, the query, the data model, the reports, and the data. Now, the template, which is right above that, it's a PBIT file, does not include any of the data. It's simply metadata, which means it has the query, the data model information, and the reports, but it doesn't include any of the actual data. So none, no actual data is stored in there. So what happens whenever you go to open up this template, and, and all I'm trying to point out to you there is the file size difference. One has the data, one does not. So if I go to open up this template, it will prompt me. I think I opened it. Yep, I did. Uh, let me see. There it comes. So I just opened the template, and you'll notice here what happens as soon as you go to open up the template is it prompts you with the parameter that we created a few moments ago. So it, we had a parameter. It's now prompting me. It says the, uh, that the name of this template is called template example, and my description is right here where I called it sales example. Type in your version of the data to get the results. So I can select my version of the database, and I could have had this left as a text box, and I could have put in a spreadsheet location. But if I select, uh, let's say, the 2012 version of the data and hit load, it's going to recreate everything that was inside of that solution using that version of the data instead of the previous version of the data. And it's going to have the default value for that parameter shown up whenever they go to open the template. Okay? So that's really how templates work. They're pretty simple. Uh, you can't really deploy templates anywhere yet. So if you're, if you're curious, hey, can I deploy that template off somewhere? Uh, you can certainly put it in a file share location. So if you're just sharing files with someone, you can put it in SharePoint. Uh, you can even put it in Reporting Services 2016 because you can really drop any type of files you want there now. So you have some uh, I, uh, places where you can place that, but there's not really a whole lot of interaction from a website other than for more file sharing purposes. So that's templates. It's pretty, it's pretty simple. You go to File, Export, and Power BI Template, and that will create a template out, template out of your solution, and then you just open that file to use it. Now, there is no editing of a template. If you want to make a change to a template, you simply have to go to the original solution, make the changes, and then overwrite the original template. There's not really any editing of a template right now. Not, a, not an easy way uh, to do that. But that's really it for what I have for you today, guys today. I'm stumbling over my words at the end here. Thomas, do you have any questions that I can take uh, as, we, as we wrap up? Yes, we do. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Great. The first question uh, was at the beginning, and the person wants to know the distinction, what's the distinction between the free version and paid version? Can you start with free and go to paid, let, paid later and not throw away any of the free work? Yeah, sure, great question. So uh, as far as the context of what we showed today, everything I showed today you can do for free. Uh, the, 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 where the portion comes into where you need to pay for it, here we go, is when you actually want to go to the look at PowerBI.com and looking at the pricing, they're really super transparent on when you have to pay and when you don't. Uh, basically, the free stuff will get you just so far. You can see you're limited on the amount of storage you have. You're limited on things like data refresh that you have here. You put the amount of data, how to refresh it, and security when it comes to the free versions. Um, 
and yeah, full circle on that question there. What language does Power BI use in the advanced M? Uh, say, say that last part one more time. In the advanced M, is that what you said? Yeah, in the advanced editor you were showing, what language was that? Ah, gotcha. Yes. So what I showed earlier is called the M query language, and you can find it, or the way I showed you how to get to it, is that uh, you went up to the advanced editor up at the very top here, and it uses, like I said, a language called M. It's just the letter M. Um, I have done some previous webinars for, for learning how to use M. Um, I'll do, I'll do a small plug here, Thomas. If you go to pragmaticcourse.com, I've done some webinars there that you can watch for free that show you really how to get started with reading M. And Thomas, do you guys have anything on, on the Excel group that previously recorded on, on that as well? We, we have some power query stuff, but nothing specific to the M language yet. That's fine. We'll gotcha. you. You, can, you can promote your website. That's fine. All right. I'll bring it up here real quick as you, as you uh, go for the next, next question. All right, the next question is, uh, when you create a list in the Query tab, can you create a list of months in chronological order as well? As you create a list in the, oh, 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 I see. So that was when I showed the between. So I did something like this. I did a new blank query, and I did something like this. We did uh, bring me back everything between 1 and 7, and your question is, can you do it chronological? So I'm assuming you're looking for something like dates. So can I do something like this? And I believe the answer is yes. Let's test it out. I know I've done this um, one way, but let's see if we can do it here like this. So let's say uh, 1, let's say 12, 31, 2015. And it didn't work this way. There, uh, there is a way you can do this. I actually have a blog post where I show how you can do that, which if you go to my blog, it's devonnightsql.com. And on my blog, I have show you how to make like a date table. And um, I'm just not thinking of it off the top of my head, but let's say date dimension. From here, I show you how to make a date dimension using the mQuery language right here, creating a date dimension with Power Query, which is the same thing as the query editor there. And I walk you through how to create a list of dates. And I actually have this pretty well documented where these uh, forward slashes here, any type place you see those forward slashes are comments. And um, so you can see things like where I'm creating a list of dates in here. It's a little bit further down. And where I, I say, basically, I have a parameter where I say plug in this date and plug in this date, your start and end date. And then it generates a list of dates. And then it also generates things like the month and the quarter and the year and that sort of thing. I think I, I have time for maybe one more. For Power BI on Word. Uh, oh, in the URL? Can you, and it says, can you use the old parameter code? Was it, so was there a previous parameter type code before which you showed was new? Yeah, there was an old way. It, does, it doesn't work anymore, but there was an old way that you can do parameters. So the short, short answer is no, uh, but so for context for everybody else, is there was a way to do parameters in the old Power BI where you had to pass things into the URL in, in SharePoint. That functionality is not there, uh, but I'm expecting some pretty big things to come with some of the stuff I showed today, So, because a lot of it is pretty new, and um, they're making some big big changes and updates in here. We're already seeing updates in some of the most recent releases on, on the this, this stuff that's already fairly new. They're already updating, so I would expect some new stuff to come where you'll be able to do things like that. Great. Yeah, we are out of time, so um, there was a couple more questions. We'll try to get some of those answered on the blog post. For you, thank you for attending the uh, monthly Excel Business Intelligence virtual chapter. Thank you again, Devin Knight, for coming and talking and uh, sharing your time with us. No problem. Thank you for having me. And uh, we look forward to having you on here again. Uh, this is being recorded, so if you go to the excelbivc.sqlpass.org site, there's a meeting archives, and in about two or three days, you will see the recording. It will go to a YouTube um, section of our virtual chapter, and you can replay it there. So thanks, everyone. Thank you.